Has Christianity gone soft? Then I suggest that you do go to the ceremony, and I suggest that you buy them a gift. We all know the world wants us to shut up, but have we caved? So it's not a sin in your church to have an abortion? I mean, God's the judge. People have to live to their own convictions, and I think if I have to tell you... Or worse yet, actually changed the gospel. We need to consider, we need to unhitch our Christianity from the Old Testament as well. What on earth are we thinking? Hey friends, and welcome to the channel. I'm Pastor AJ Platt, and I like talking all things gospel. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up for me right now. I'd greatly appreciate it. You can also subscribe to my channel and visit PastorAJ.com where you can sign up for my weekly email newsletter or buy my new book, End Times Mission, and Introduction to Postmillennial Eschatology. Man, that's a mouthful. All right, back to the topic of soft church. You know, this has been building in me for some time, and look, I'm pro-church. I've been a pastor for nearly a quarter century. I want the church to succeed. Look, so do a lot of other people, and I'm sure you're one of them. That's why you're watching this video. So what's the deal? Well, some time back, it became evident to me that the church in the West, that's where we live, you know, America, the West, it became evident to me that the church in the West has become impotent in creating broader cultural transformation. Think the church has had success? Think again. No, I'm not talking historically. I'm talking recently. And if you do think we're being successful right now, what about how the contemporary church is losing the debate on significant moral issues like marriage, race, and gender ideology? Think about it. Somewhere along the line, it became okay to not have prayer in schools, to not have Christianity and Jesus as the highlight of our educational process, because you know, somehow that shows preference to Christians. But wait a minute, don't Christians worship the one and only true God? Isn't everyone else either pagan in practice or by default? So I started thinking about the reason for all this, and just then the algorithm suggested this video to me. The video is a leadership lesson by Kerry Newhoff. He's someone who's gotten a pretty good following over the years. He has a reputation for being a good interviewer. I even got to see him interview the founder and CEO of Charity Water. And at one point, I even took the leaders in my church through one of his courses. I'm both pro-church and pro-growth. I've even studied church growth on both a master's and doctorate level. And so look, I think the church needs to add bodies inside its buildings. This is what it means to fulfill the Great Commission. Jesus said to go disciple the nations. That was a big vision. It means church growth. And so in thinking about that, I want to just take a look at some of the things mentioned here, because I believe that they show us why this nation isn't being discipled. In fact, I think this is part of the problem. As Christians, we're not thinking about cultural transformation. We're focusing too much on the individual experience, and it's hurting us big time. This particular video covers the subject of why people have stopped going to your church. Every pastor wants to know the answer to this question, right? But I think his answer to the question, which is actually meant to be an encouragement to pastors, underscores the fundamental weakness in modern evangelical Christianity. So if you are a pastor, think about what I have to say on this topic and how the things that I'm saying might put you in a better position to engage your culture and maybe even grow your church. In this video, I want to share with you the number one reason people have stopped coming to your church. So I think a lot of people would say, well, you know what? We're in a secular culture and we're being persecuted. I don't know many pastors in America, at least, in my social circles, that would blame lack of church attendance on persecution. I mean, certainly the way things are going, it could get to that point. I'd also add to that that global Christian persecution is kind of a big deal. And the way things are going, we may begin to see some of this in our own communities in the West. I mean, honestly, the, the church should probably begin to think about how its strategy to fulfill the Great Commission would adapt to a truly post-Christian environment, where the gospel and the Bible is not only frowned upon, but persecuted. And look, what he's really trying to get at here is, as a pastor, as a leader, don't blame other people or those who are living in your community because they don't want to be a part of the culture that you've created. Maybe 
do a better job of creating a better culture that people want to be a part of. You know, don't come down with Elijah complex. I'm the only one left serving you, Lord. Instead, get out there in your communities and make a difference. Be engaged. So good message. But listen to the reason that he gives to encourage pastors to recapture their passion and maybe some of the subsequent strategies this underlying belief might produce can say, well, it's just atheism. Atheism is on the rise. Well, a little bit, but most people are still spiritual. In fact, did you know there are 40 million Christians, people who honestly have a biblical worldview, who don't attend church in the United States. So why aren't they coming to church? I mean, 40 million. I don't know where the statistic comes from, but 40 million Christians, Christians, not attending church, I hope you're not one of those. I personally have come to view secularism as the problem, not so much atheism, but the myth that people can be neutral toward religious issues. In large part, this has come about in our country because of a misguided understanding of a separation of church and state, because historically, the founders of our country and even generations that had come before us didn't mean by that that religion had no place in the public square. But today, that's what it's come to mean. So in today's day and age, secularism has just emerged as a new religion that is pushing Christianity out. So atheism, not the problem, but secularism in a culture that embraces it wholeheartedly, kind of a big deal and something that the church needs to address in this age. Why did most churches lose 30, 40, 50% of the people who called their church home after COVID? Answer, it's not antagonism, it's not atheism, it's not persecution, you know what it is? It's indifference. Okay, so there it is, indifference. Now let's listen to how he fleshes this out as the main cause for a lack of church attendance. It's indifference. People just kind of looked around and went, you know, not a bad church, just not great. And for some reason, I don't know, I'm just not going anymore. I'm not going anymore. That's indifference. So when they look at, you know, we could go to the mountains or we could sleep in or we could go for brunch with friends or we could go to the beach this weekend. That seems to be a more appealing option than a church that they're indifferent about. What are your thoughts on this and why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing it up because I think it illustrates a key strategy. Yes, strategy that many preachers and church leaders take to growing their churches. That strategy is just to mimic what the world is doing, but do it better, and people will want to come to my church. Now, look, I'm not saying church shouldn't be fun. I'm a firm believer that it should be, and even sometimes cool. But we've seen the dangers of this. We can probably all think of an example where a church has taken something too far trying to reach the community. And I can't help but wonder if this isn't part of the problem for Western culture, and in particular, Christianity in Western culture. Well, where do some of these strategies, you know, strategies like pole dancing striptease act at your men's conference? Which backfired dramatically, by the way. Mark, we are calling you to publicly repent. Well, I think they come from this idea that people just need motivated. You know, so sometimes people lose motivation. I mean, don't we all? When I think about the fact that 40 million people can identify as Christian, yet not attend a Christian church, one of the distinguishing marks that gives you the label Christian. It says to me that there's something deeper going on here. There's, there's some way in which the church isn't meeting that discipleship process. And I'm not talking about disconnecting from culture here. I'm talking about truly engaging it to the point where the entire nation is discipled. Why is evangelicalism falling flat, at least currently? It's because we think indifference apathy is something that just needs a little motivation. When I think the truth is, the root is that there is something much deeper and darker going on in our culture. People get indifferent because they hate God and they hate accountability. That's not a popular message. And I don't even like to talk like this, but it's the truth. You know, some of our enemies, in my mind's eye, in terms of church attendance, are, are overwhelming prosperity, generational prosperity. 
in America. We don't know suffering in this country. Could it be that we're indifferent, not just because we need a little kick in the behind, but because people by nature, myself included, are overwhelmingly sinful. And when we have the opportunity to do anything other than what God wants us to do, we often choose it. So I think what I'd like to see from the church and church leadership is a broader strategy for addressing this issue in culture. We're going to need it. And until we have it, our churches are going to maybe grow numerically a little. Some of them may even have great success, but we're not going to see entire communities changed like we saw in the early church. So that's why I think having a proper reason will help us to develop the right strategy for the cultural transformation we want to see. So the hardest part about indifference is that people don't hate you. They don't despise you. They're just kind of indifferent to you. They just kind of shrug it off. Now, sometimes why does indifference happen? Indifference happens often when leaders lose passion for the mission. Maybe, you know, it's pretty easy to be more passionate about attendance on a Sunday than it is about the mission that your church exists for. Maybe you've lost passion for Sunday. Ministry is hard, I get it. But if you want to battle indifference, one of the best things you can do is rekindle your passion for ministry. Here's what's true about ministry and leadership, is your church will never be more passionate about the mission than you are. And listen, I understand as a leader, I've led a church for 20 years plus. There's a point at which, you know, your passion wanes a little bit, but it's got to get back there because if your passion for the mission isn't white hot, your people's won't be either. Now, I don't want to be overly critical here, and I understand why Kerry is giving the advice that he's giving. In fact, he gives a lot of good advice. I've listened to his content for years. But I don't think passion in and of itself is the answer. Just getting more bodies in your church building isn't the answer either. What I think the Christian and the pastor should be pursuing is culture-wide transformation. Yes, by growing a church, you're making a dent in the culture. I get it. But the problem is, as preachers, as pastors, is when we lock in on that because it can lead to some unhealthy conclusions. I wonder if that wouldn't change our strategy just a bit. Because if we're just looking to win over the individual, it might indirectly lead to small-mindedness. And I think keep us from accomplishing Jesus' mission in our communities. And just a bit of a side note, but is indifference really just sort of a meh? Or is it a hate? Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. He said, you're either for or against me. He seemed to put some pretty sharp dividing lines in his preaching. So when you're battling indifference, here's what the average person is thinking on a Sunday morning. Do I go to church or do I just go to the beach? Or do we just cook breakfast and hang out with friends? Like, what do we do, right? That's kind of indifference. It's not a hostility. It's just they fail to see the relevance. See, people grow indifferent to something when they don't see value. So churches in competition with the beach. And it's just, no offense, indifference that makes a person choose the beach over church. And the church needs to adjust its thinking and its strategy to compete with the beach. I don't know if you're seeing what I'm saying, but I think our thinking about stuff can really lead to some of the wrong conclusions. And like I already said, the problem isn't just indifference when we look at what's going on in our culture today. We've got some pretty serious problems, and we don't just need to motivate the indifferent to get their butts to church. We need to pray for and pursue some significantly larger culture-wide change. That's what the gospel is actually all about. If it's not about that, then what's the point? It's about culture-wide change. Christians in past generations understood this. That's why we're Christians today, and we need to follow their example. When they don't see value, if they can get what they perceive they can get from you somewhere else, they just don't see the value, and so they don't come. It's not like everyone left. It's not like they left. They just don't come anymore. You know, my girlfriend didn't dump me. I just haven't seen her for three years. If you want to battle that, One of the best things you can do is to recapture your own passion, not for seeing 
people in the pews. But if you get white hot about the mission, if you rekindle that passion, not just about, you know, this is going to be a great sermon. I want you to have great sermons too. But if you can get genuinely passionate about reaching people, about loving people, about being for your community, about making a difference in people's lives, about getting the gospel out there, you know what? That gets contagious. And passion is really hard to be indifferent to. I'm not talking about passionate partisanship or saying extreme things for the sake of saying extreme things. Okay, so I think this is one of the places where you will see this mentality in those who practice a church growth model, or what's become known as church growth model. It doesn't mean that every pastor doesn't want to grow their church. It's just that there is a strategy and an ideology that's referred to as church growth. And usually what comes with that is not handling controversial topics. You know, I would never tell somebody just to plunge headlong into controversy for controversy's sake. Jesus didn't turn tables over in the temple just so he'd go viral. He did it because he was overcome with the holiness of God. And he wanted to see God's house be a place where everyone could come to find healing and the hope that the kingdom of God is supposed to be all about. So like I said, not horrible advice here. I think Carrie's saying a lot of the right things, especially about being passionate about the gospel. But passion alone isn't going to bring about the righteousness that God wants to see in me or my community. So passion, good. But don't just be passionate to see a few more people in your church pews or be naive enough to think that they're not there because they're feeling a little meh. The people in our communities and our culture need to be motivated by the coming judgment. And you don't think the early church preached this? Just look at the Apostle Paul's sermon in the book of Acts to the pagan community at Athens. He talks about how God is calling them to forsake idols, that is to actually change. And he bases that, look in Acts chapter 17, on the fact that God will judge each and every one of us by the one man, Jesus, whom he has appointed over the living and the dead. So passion, yes, but passion for the right things. Rekindle your passion for these things, and I think not only will your church grow, but your influence will grow exponentially. I'm talking about a genuine love for God and Jesus, a genuine love for the mission of Amen. the church, and a genuine outpouring into the community and the lives of the people that you serve. That kind of thing becomes irresistible. So number one reason people probably aren't going to church, it's indifference. It's indifference. It's not hatred. It's not persecution. It's none of that. It's just indifference. And the way to battle that is through passion. So there you have it, folks. Just a little bit of a gentle pushback on many of the strategies and thought processes that we see being utilized in today's church. You know, I can't help but think it's not the idea of rekindling your passion for the mission, but reassessing your vision for the mission. To me, this is the biggest problem in our church in our little contextualized version of Christianity here in the West. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like more of a capitalist. I love capitalism, by the way. Definitely better than Marxism or communism. But I don't know if it's capitalist Christianity that's just looking to make greater sales instead of taking over the entire culture, taking over the country, taking the world back for Christ. I assure you, King Jesus is hard at work doing this very thing, and he won't settle for anything less. Friends, preach the gospel. Have a bigger vision of your city. Yes, your entire city, New York or Dallas or rural small town, making an open declaration and commitment to Christ in all of its affairs. Imagine the prosperity and the healing that God would unleash in your little world if you could be successful at accomplishing that mission. That is the gospel. That is, that is the kingdom. It's the good news that King has offered us forgiveness of sins. And he calls all men and women everywhere to repent in order to receive this new life. Preach the gospel that way, and I think you'll see far better results. And ask yourself this question before you go. How can you fulfill that mission in your community? Indeed, that's what God is calling you to do. 
get out there into your world and take it back for Jesus. God be with you, friends, and I hope you liked this video. If you don't mind, again, give me a thumbs up. I'd greatly appreciate it. God bless you, and leave your thoughts in a comment. I'd love to hear what you think about all this, especially if you're in church leadership. Tell me your vision for your community and your church's role in that, but please make it a big one. God bless you, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye.